Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Johnson, and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement at the University of Colorado Boulder's Leeds School of Business. Leeds is a top business school offering undergraduate, MBA, MS, and PhD programs, and has an alumni network of over 41,000 strong living and working around the world. We're excited to have David Dwight presenting on Applying the Science of Argument to Marketing for today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask, please send those questions through your chat interface. I will monitor questions as they are submitted and they will be answered throughout the presentation. As a reminder, for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants later today along with a survey link. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, David Dwight. David is co-author of Critical Thinking for Marketers, a new book on applying the science of argument to support marketing actions. He has led strategic planning, business development, marketing, sales and operations for brands like Mercury Marine and Cummins, as well as for startup and entrepreneurial ventures. A year ago, he left the Fortune 100 world for his current position as Vice President and General Manager of Truflex, a Midwest manufacturer. Although he has moved a lot over the years, David considers himself a Coloradan. He holds an engineering degree, and he received his MBA from the University of Colorado Leeds School of Business. David currently lives in Indianapolis with his wife of 25 years, and he also has two children in college. Welcome, David, and thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, I wish I could do this from Boulder. It's such a beautiful town, and between my wife and I, we hold uh, three degrees from Boulder, so uh, we're we're we like to get back into that area uh, on occasion, but unfortunately, we're not there now. So I'll dive in uh, to this presentation. First few slides for people who get the the abstract and some of the bio background is is included in some of the handout materials uh, that may be made available later. When I start talking about this subject and really any subject, I always like to start about uh, defining the problem. I think it's my engineering background. Uh, in this case, I'd like to sum it up by saying it's not what a, about what to think, it's about uh, how to think, which leads us to critical thinking as a competency. Critical thinking is a known problem in business and those who are better thinkers are more highly valued and will likely become more successful. So learning how to think is worth investment and attention. This slide really outlines, I'm obviously not gonna read all the details to you, but you know, scanning some of the popular press, there's a lot of discussion and talk about how important it is in the business world to become better at critical thinking. So we took this as authors, my co-authors and I, and we started thinking about uh, how this applies to marketing. Some people mistakenly think about marketing as limited to things like creative and advertising, et cetera. I'm sure you all know that marketing as a function is much more broad and strategic than that. The marketing function is heavily involved in decision making, and I would argue that the marketing decisions and the arguments which support them are some of the most important and strategic activities in any business. There's plenty on this page about what to think, and none of it is wrong. The point is that the key to decision making is not necessarily the tools, not the content, but how they're used. So you go through this page and you see the traditional tools of like the four P's of marketing. Um, you know, marketing and marketers turn often to books and consultants to help. Uh, and, and always too, there's a lot of data and we're getting a lot more data today than we ever have. And that plentiful data is actually in some cases making it harder uh, because data can actually become a, a crutch or it can obfuscate you know, what's, what's really there. So this, this last point about the data um, delivers me into one of the things that, that, uh, that I find is a bit of a pet peeve. And so I'd like to take a slight detour on a sidebar to talk about the 
our our collective approach as an industry or as a profession uh, of, to data. And, and I've witnessed some of these problems countless times, and it's becoming even more important as we all get infatuated with things like big data and the Internet of Things, etc. So this is my plea to not just become data-based. I've worked for a number of companies and a number of locations where oftentimes people talk about, you know, we're you know prideful in being data-based in our decision making. I think that one of the things that's really important is that this isn't enough. It's it's really just the beginning. Don't check the box after the data gathering. There's a whole host of other things that need to be done before you can really arrive at a decision. So the pyramid on the right is one of the ones I like to use either in coaching opportunities or even within my own business to let people know that the going out and gathering that data, starting at the bottom of the pyramid with the data, progressing to some analysis of that data, that data becomes knowledge and wisdom, and then you can make a decision of it. People often don't quite know what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is, and there's an easy way to talk about it, and knowledge is knowing tomatoes are fruit, whereas wisdom is knowing not to put them in a fruit salad. So uh, so our that's my sidebar pitch on you know how data uh, needs to be treated as a critical ingredient, but isn't the answer, not the place to stop. And so, so we all need to be able to make sure we're progressing through that. And we'll bring this up a little bit later in in one of the later slides as a reminder that that asking a lot of questions usually leads to a lot of data. And then you got to make sure you don't just stop it at listening to those answers. You got to analyze them. But back to the to the, our main thought and our main thread. You know, marketers should make influence and support key decision making through critical thinking, which is then supported and communicated with sound, well-founded arguments. So as marketers, we all need to be good at this critical thinking. Uh, we need to be generating valid and sound deductive arguments and or strong uh, and cogent inductive arguments to make and support our decisions and making the recommendations. To understand this, it's important to understand the scientific methods behind inductive and deductive reasoning pathways. And this is illustrated on the right-hand side of, of this slide. You can see that inductive reasoning uh, really starts with uh, starts at the top with, with an observation or uh, some experiment and observation. And so usually you get data. And then you make some generalizations, generalizations from this data, and then you come up with a paradigm or a theory. In reverse, a deductive reasoning is usually you start with a theory, you make some predictions, and then you you make some observation uh, from you know you, you make a prediction, and then you try and go get some data or some observations that support this. And if and if you have that, uh, and if that all links together, then you've got some good arguments on your hand. So when you think about it, inductive reasoning uses patterns or numerous examples to arrive at our conclusions. So you start with, you know, you'd have theories, hypothesis, observation, uh, and then confirmation. And then deductive reasoning uses facts, rules, definitions, properties to arrive at a conclusion, information pattern, a tentative hypothesis, or theory. So I want to revisit why this is important. And the reason why this is important is because marketing needs to make recommendations on the four P's. So good recommendations lead to success, as, as we've you know mentioned earlier. And in order for recommendation to be good, they need to be arrived at and supported by critical thinking, either in an inductive way or in a deductive way. So critical thought presented well is, is easily supported by leadership. And, and so you can do that in either an inductive or a deductive way. So you can start with the theory, this will sell better than that is your prediction, and then you go out and you prove it, or you bring data and say, you know, apples are selling better than oranges, so we're going to make some generalizations, and then we're going to create a theory about, you know, our next steps in, in, in our uh, product decision. You know, what product we should make next. Should we make more apples or more oranges? So part of the point of this slide is, is to really just to prove that there's a lot of real critical thinking elements in the profession of marketing. And marketing isn't just about um, gut feel or about 
art, there's quite a bit of science to it, and, and we need to be taking a lot of care and pride in that science. Now, I'd like to take us through a quick illustration of what is really an oversimplified marketing argument um, in a kind of business, realistic business setting. The reason to do this is so that we have a uh, set of arguments that we can then later discuss um, how they, um, what kind of logical fallacies may have been used in some of these arguments. So this little vignette is made up of John Black, who's the VP of marketing, and William Smith, who's the firm's CFO. And it doesn't really matter, but they, they make and market anvils, you know, blacksmith, get it? Um, and then they're going through a yearly budget review. So, so the rationale that John is giving for, um, for his advertising budget is pretty typical. He's making a justification to the CFO. And you may have heard some kind of similar arguments in, in your profession, in your professional experience. So William, or Bill as we call him, he says, John, I've reviewed your marketing budget for the upcoming fiscal year, and I see that your line items really haven't changed all that much from previous years. You still plan on spending the majority of your budget on television advertising and social media, with a minority of your budget going to the standard trade shows we attend and the selected charity events we support. So then he goes on, Bill goes on to say, what I found a little bit surprising, John, is that you're asking for a 5% increase in your budget overall, with most of the increase going to television advertising and social media. The most I recall ever increasing the advertising budget is two or maybe 3%. I know sales are up, but honestly, I was expecting maybe a two or 3% increase. So Bill concludes then with this, which is the marketing, uh, or, or the market, forgive me, the market is going to stay strong forever as much as we like it. How did you come up with this 5% figure? Sounds like a typical finance guy, doesn't he? So he's basically saying, hey, you know, the markets aren't gonna last forever. You know, we can't be spending much. You know, why, why'd you come up with this 5% figure? So John comes back with, I see where you're coming from, Bill, but our marketing team has done its homework. And we believe that we've got some good reasons to ask for that extra few percent goes on to say, first, as you know, the company has already exceeded its aggressive sales and profit targets for the fiscal year, and we believe that was in large part due to last year's increased advertising budget and the new corporate image campaign we launched last year. Most of the campaign's expenditures went into television and social, social media. Heck, if advertising is working, then our sales and profits should go up, and they did, so advertising works. Second, and Bill, you know this is the case since you've been with the company for over 10 years. Every year, year in, year out, marketing is always having to fight engineering, manufacturing, and customer service for every dollar in our budget. And you know what? Nothing, not even the research we've conducted, has ever shown that our advertising isn't working. That's just a fact, Bill, and you can't be ignored. Finally, and you know this from last week's meeting, not only our advertising agency, but the article I showed you in Advertising Age, has shown that companies all over the U.S. are increasing their advertising budgets, and that includes our competitors. We have to match their ad spends, and our message, or our message, is going to be drowned out by those of our competitors. John concludes, I know that 5% is high, but my team is strongly believes that we have good reason to request that increase. So Bill closes with, I understand what you're saying, John, and it sounds to me like you're making a good case for your budget. I'll give it my preliminary approval, and next week I'll recommend the board that you get your 5%. I wish I had uh, softies like, uh, like this CFO where I work, but, but I don't. So, so if you think through it, what he said is the marketing teams are logical for requesting the budget increase. You know, they're logical. The unexpected increase in company sales were indeed preceded by marketing's new advertising campaign, and so therefore, no one had, um, uh, there were, therefore, we should spend more. No one had ever offered evidence that the firm's advertising wasn't working. And by all accounts, competitors had indeed been increasing their advertising budget. So his recommendation to the board seems to be completely logical, except that it isn't. So this is a really simple case, and it seems kind of uh, sophomoric, but, but it's one of the ways that we can start illustrating what um, what 
is a marketing argument and, and how to think about the conversation that's going on. So when you think about a marketing argument, it's a set of statements comprising premises and a conclusion. So, um, you know, Webster's dictionary definition of statements a proposition that can either be true or false. So it does just because a statement doesn't mean it's true or false. Premises are the reasons given as to why you should believe uh, a conclusion. And the conclusion is what you're trying to make your audience accept. So on the diagram on the right, as you read from the top down, you can read this really two ways. You can read this uh, flow chart um, from the top or from the bottom. As you go from the top down, you can where the arrows are, you can actually say because. So, so the conclusion is we need to increase our advertising budget by 5%. And if you follow down the right-hand side, because increased competitors' uh, advertising will drown out our current campaign because competitors have increased their advertising budgets. Alternatively, you can read these charts from the bottom up. And in the, in the arrows, you would say, therefore. So going from the left, you say um, sales and profits uh, increased after increasing this year's budget and launching the new advertising campaign. Therefore, our advertising works. Therefore, increasing advertising will increase sales and profits this year. Therefore, we need to increase our advertising budget by 5%. So it's pretty simple, but most arguments, most uh, ways of convincing people can be laid out in a form like this. And, you, and this is a good way of, of laying out that, that argument. One of the ways that we know that this is um, false, or one of the things that, that I can even suggest is is knowing um, to, to question this fallacy is is even looping back to the beginning of he made a recommendation for five percent, and so far there's actually nothing that supports um, five percent, maybe six percent, maybe eight percent, maybe three percent. So that's one one key thing to be looking out for uh, in when looking for fallacies is. Um, Maybe the conclusion actually doesn't fully support the the original uh, the original statement because if you go back to the original statement, he actually was asking for for a specific number, um, not just an increase. So um, so that's that's kind of a, re a red flag. But explaining the fallacies just a little bit more because I want to actually um, leave you with with some understanding about what logical fallacies are. Um, and, and this vignette had an example of three is, um, is this way. So, so one of his statements of, heck, if the advertising is working, then our sales should go up. And they did. And this fallacy is actually called affirming the consequent. Um, on an ac academic basis, the, the logic notation, um, uh, looks like this. And the, on the left-hand side, you've got this, if P is true, then Q is true. Since Q is true, you can then, you therefore say that P is true. So if you link that back to what he had said is, if our advertising is working, which is P, then our sales and profits will increase. So that's what he is, he's trying to, to, to say as a logical, you know, a logical statement. And then since the sales and profits increased, that, which is Q, therefore, it's true that our advertising is working. But we all know that there can be many other causes um, than just uh, the, 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 the data presented. So we don't know if, if sales went up because prices went up. We don't know if sales went up because a new product was introduced. So really, he's narrowed this down to, uh, to a, a fallacy called affirming the consequent, which is because I'm able to give you two events and they were um, consistent in time, I can fool you into believing the fallacy that these were cause and effect, and that if you, if you do P, then Q will happen uh, the same next time. So that, that, that was one of the fallacies. So if we go on, there was, there was, there was two more fallacies uh, in, in, in the argument. There was probably more than two more, but the, these are two more that I pulled out. Um, one of them is called arguing from ignorance, and this is one of those um, uh, interesting fallacies. And, and this is a good time to point out, these are actually academic names. These, these fallacies, you can go out and research logical fallacies, and there's probably 300 different types of logical fallacies. Obviously, not all of them apply to you know, the business context that we live in, but a number of them do, like this arguing from ignorance. So 
his statement was nothing, not even research we've con conducted has ever shown that our advertising isn't working. Well, two things, it's really hard to prove something doesn't exist, which is one of the things that this argument is also trying to prove. But um, in this case, really, just because no one has proven a given proposition is false doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. So, so just because we haven't proven it doesn't work doesn't necessarily mean that it does work. So in, in this case, you, you, because you don't know something doesn't mean that you, you don't not know something doesn't mean that you do know it, right? So, so that's called the arguing from, from ignorance. The, the last one um, on this case was this appeal to popularity, which is a pretty common um, logical fallacy, I would say, used in marketing which is, is kind of the everyone's doing it, we should do it too kind of kind of argument. I've seen it used in, in, in the we have to continue going to trade shows because everyone else is going to trade shows kind of arguments. And, and you know, as, especially as we get into new media, uh, new different types of advertising, I think there's a, a real need to start reviewing, you know, do, just because everyone else is going to trade shows or just because everyone else is doing it doesn't necessarily mean we need to as well. So in his statement, he says, you know, we have to match our competitors' ad spends and message, otherwise we're going to be drowned out. So in this case, he's saying just because everyone else is doing it, this is his appeal to popularity. Um, he's invoking it it's based on the, the reasoning that if everyone else is doing X, we should also be doing it. So, so those are three of the fallacies that, that we um, are able to illustrate with that little uh, vignette between between. John and, and, and Bill. So I took the first few uh, or took first 20 minutes to talk about the, the you know the need for uh, having critical thinking and then the fact that we actually do have you know quite a chance to have bad thinking or logical fallacies within our function. And so I would like to spend a little bit of time to talk about you know what we do about it as professionals. Uh, the very first thing is is this. Um, and I'm not very good at Latin, but it's it's primum non nocere, as I believe that way is pronounced. But it's it basically means first do no harm. So part of my uh, part of my message is let's not all of us generate fallacies in the work that we do, right? So so maybe we can defend against others, but first we need to make sure we're not doing any harm. So there's there are a couple of checklists that we could use. Um, and, and some ways of thinking about what we're doing and how we're uh, making our arguments, the research that we're doing, the, the presentations that we're putting together, that we can um, we actually assess whether these meet the logic and truth conditions. So for something to be true, it needs to have a, a logic condition and a truth condition. So in the logic condition, you, you assume that, your, uh, that your, your premise are true or at a minimum plausible. To your audience, and then step two is: is this with this assumption, does your conclusion logically flow from these premise? And if those logic conditions are are true, like in John's example, um, he, he wasn't really true, but he his his logic condition he, he used was was affirming the consequent, which is actually a logical fallacy, which is why his argument breaks down. But once you have that logic condition you then need to have a truth condition. So if your, mar if your argument meets the truth condition, then you can examine each of your argument's premises to make sure that they're also true. So if, if all of this holds together, if your logic condition is, is valid and your truth conditions are valid, such as are they true or a minimum plausible to your audience? Um, are your premise understandable? Do they have good evidentiary support? And do you have any unstated premises that need to be made more explicit? All these things are true, then you're probably making a pretty good, tight, sound argument, and and you haven't uh, uh, you haven't proceeded to do harm first yourself. So taking the first step of making sure we're not breaking our own rules, uh, then we can start taking the next step in dealing with logical fallacies. There's probably a lot of different ways of dealing with logical fallacies in our in our daily life. Some of them are, um, you know especially if you're dealing with your boss as your boss's boss, you know, you need to deal with, with that person making a fallacy a little bit different than with, uh, with peers or people below you. Um, so obviously 
there needs to be some wise application of, of, of these tools, making sure you take into account some potential political uh, consequence or, or career consequences. You know, as I say, you can say anything on your last day at work. So, so make sure it's not that kind of uh, kind of uh, fight about logical fallacies. So, I, I like lumping these into into three groups. So, first is marketing as a science. Uh, as we talked about up at the beginning of, of the conversation today, you know, there it, it is a science, and there's a lot of work that's done um, that is evidence based and and proving whether products work, whether you know, a certain marketing channel works, uh, whether whether an advertising campaign is working or not, and that's really science. It's not all just art. So make sure you're conducting experiments, you know, whether they're real experiments or thought experiments. Get data, use math, um, and then if you're on the receiving side, assume that it's okay to ask for proof, right? So that's the the concept of you know, are our experiments repeatable? Um, so so the first thing is. Make sure you think about marketing. It, it is a science. It isn't just all art. Uh, I think the second one is I always point people back to is that decision pyramid, um, little little icon there on the left hand side. Um, so the the bottom line on this is don't be satisfied with an amount of data. Uh, you need to be satisfied with a quality of the analysis. So so don't be going into um, to arguments with with only data. Or don't be listening to people who are all they're doing is uh, is spewing data, without taking us through the how does this become, um, uh, how does that data go from analysis to to knowledge to wisdom to decision making. So making sure that that we're not stopping at that first step of just gathering data, and that we're actually doing analysis, and that our analysis meets the the logic tests uh, of of science, and then. Ask a lot of questions, and there's really two key ways we can do that, um, and I'll outline them on, on some further slides. But you know, the Socratic method. If you've ever been in a, a school situ situation where they taught in a Socratic method, it's really just a lot of questioning and a lot of asking questions. And I've got a slide on that. And then there's the five whys. Now, this is something that comes a little bit more from a manufacturing side, and it kind of reveals my my background in manufacturing. Uh, and it's a it originated as a, a um, a common Toyota manufacturing technique uh, from Toyota Motor Company about trying to get to root cause, and I'll have a slide on that. But really, that these two uh, methods or any other method of just asking a lot of questions is a good way of teasing out whether a, a logic is is false or holds together, or whether it's something that should be considered valid and, and a good basis on which we should make the um, uh, decisions. The sunset box here on this page uh, says, look for the frequent flyer, which is correlation versus causation. So I find that probably in a, in a majority of, of arguments, there is a large number of, of errors made in this. Just because things correlate, just because the advertising went up at the same time as our sales went up, does not mean that the advertising caused the sales to go up. And so I think that's a, a frequent flyer to always be looking out for, and it's and it's pretty easy. And and one of the things to ask probably is the question, back to asking lots of questions: Are these results correlated, or do you have causal relationship between the, the two events? And that's a pretty simple question to ask, um, and and uh, usually is a smart way of teasing out whether um, whether there's a good chain of events that that if we do A, then B happens, and then C happens. So diving a little bit more into the Socratic question method, typically, and there's a couple different ways people have, have gathered this. I did a little bit of online research, and this is based on um, R.W. Paul's six types of Socratic questions. Some people group them into seven types. There's a couple people group them into five. But basically, you, you get the point that there's, there's usually a, a ways of asking these kinds of questions. So the first thing, obviously, is to ask for clarification. So why did you say that? How does that relate to our discussion? Kinds of, of clarification questions. And sometimes that can tease out whether some, some data or some analysis is real. Questions that probe some assumptions, you know, the questions like what could we assume instead? Or how can you verify or disapprove that, that assumption? Um, there's questions that probe reasons and evidence. You know, what would be an example? 
what is or analogous to that? Um, what do you think causes that to happen and why? Then the fourth type is questions about viewpoints or perspectives. And this is sometimes where it starts getting a little bit hairy in the professional world and, and maybe political uh, um, is, you know, what would you, uh, you know, what would be an alternative? Uh, what's another way to look at it? Um, would you explain why it's necessary or beneficial and who benefits? You know, really asking who benefits is, is maybe a, a, a third rail in some cases, um, you know, and why is this the best? You know, what are the strengths and weaknesses? You know, how are such and such similar? Um, what is a counter argument for? Trying to get people to maybe think about the opposite side. Those are all questions about viewpoints or perspectives uh, in, in the Socratic method. Um, questions that probe implications and consequences. So um, once again, this is, gets back to some of that reasoning uh, thinking of, of after we've had a lot of discussions, you can ask some questions like, so what are the generaliz generalizations that we can make? Or if someone presents a lot of data, but then doesn't really tie it all together, that's another good question of what generalizations can we make? What are the consequences of that assumption? So obviously, we can never prove everything. We can never always hold everything constant. We do have to make some assumptions. Um, some people make some convenient assumptions or, or some assumptions that, that may benefit their argument. So one way of, of trying to get to the root of that might be asking the question of what are the consequences of that assumption? Um, what are you implying? Meaning kind of what's, what, what are the implications of, of some of the presentation? You know, how does such and such affect such and such? That's kind of a causal linkage um, type thing. So, so how does how does um, this advertising, you know, on TV affect what we might do on advertising in print media, for instance? You know, could be a way to bring out uh, more discussion on a subject. Um, and then, how does what you know this more recent event or this more uh, now currently presented analysis or data or or, or the decision that we're making tie in with what we've learned before. And really the, in this case, the, the sixth type of question is, is questions about the question. Sometimes people will start asking some questions and, and it's a good way to get um, derailed potentially. Um, so you're, you're using the tactic yourself, but, uh, but hopefully you're using it in a skilled way and for the right reasons. Um, but others may be, uh, may be using some similar tactics but with maybe not the same um, impact and effect and, and positive uh, push that, that we're trying it. So sometimes it's good to ask them about their questions. So what's the point of the question? And this might not be necessarily the question in the conversation as much as it could be the question in general. Why are we asking about whether advertising um, uh, spend should go up? Um, you know, why is this a question? It, you know, so that, that could be another thing to ask. Um, and moving on to you know why do you think that we should be asking this question you know why are we why is there any uh, objection to us keeping the advertising budget steady um, you know and and what does you know something about the question mean um, and and so so you can lump all these socratic questions into these groups and it's nice to keep this uh, at hand uh, and, and think about, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to ask some questions that are not necessarily offensive, but really draw out conversations. And it's those conversations that can be, can be really valuable to to uh, vet out and to do some adjudication about whether an argument is is logical or fallacious. The the next method in, in about asking a whole lot of questions is is the five whys. So this was originally developed by Sakichi Toyota as part of the Toyota production system. And they have used it at Toyota for decades. And, it's, and it really is to identify the root cause of problems. So starting with the abstract and end with a specific cause, look for the chain of events. Um, this method can help avoid correlation, correlation over causation um, and because you're really looking for the causes. And it can be adapted for robustness, right? So, so you may need to ask more than five letters deep, or you may ask less, right? And then one of the one of the um, criticisms in 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 the academia about the five whys is that if you if you strictly apply it in a linear sense, you assume that 
certain cases don't have two reasons that come together. So, so you may need to adopt, you know, a, a method that allows for some branches. So, so you may go two or three layers deep and then have to branch and start asking why um, in, 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 in more branches as you go in. So, so this is a pretty famous um, process in, in manufacturing, uh, Lean Six Sigma, TQM, uh, Total Quality Management. Um, but it's something that marketing can use as well to get at the root uh, and, and can be a great help in that correlation, correlation versus causation issue. So if, if I think about this um, in, in our own illustration, you know, you know, why did the sales go up? Because of advertising? You know, this is a good opportunity to ask you know, for no other reason. This is one of those cases where you, there may be so, so, some branches in this. Um, so, you know, second question being, why did advertising make sales go up? Because twice as many people came into our store might be the answer. And then the next layer of question might be, why did two times as many people come into the store? The answer might be, because the advertising made them connect with our value proposition. And then the next question might be, you know, why hadn't people been connecting with our value proposition in the past? And the answer might be, because they didn't know our store was so conveniently located. And then the last question might be, why hadn't people known uh, we were so conveniently located? Because we have a new location, right? So, so you might be able to say, you know, this actually gets to the root cause of our new location is really what's driving up our sales. Now, maybe we, we did need to do advertising. I'm not making a, a, a value judgment about advertising or not, but it's really important to, in, in this case, to say, um, you know, what was the real root cause? So, so the judgment may be, now that we've advertised a new location, we, we, we may not need to do the same advertising again, for instance, in this case. Once again, it's a simple, oversimplified um, illustration of, you know, using an advertising and advertising budget but just trying to, to um, illustrate how you know asking these kinds of questions might help get to a root cause and uh, facilitate a discussion about um, the, the practical matters and, and how to make decisions better for the marketing uh, function and marketing budget. So my summary recap, um, market or even company failures can result from poor decisions. You know, critical thinking is a valuable commodity in, in business decision making. Markers need to be good at critical thinking to support their recommendations to management. Markers need to be on the lookout for logical fallacies. Employ scientific method uh, when they're either looking out for these other people who might have logical fallacies or, or trying to execute their own arguments. Uh, you know, we need to execute quality analysis and keep asking penetrating questions to succeed at our critical thinking. And, you know, marketers who avoid logical fallacies and execute marketing science will achieve market and customer, uh, or not customer, but company success. So that's my recap. Starting at the top, we talked a little bit about, um, about the necessity for, um, for critical thinking. And we've progressed hopefully to the end here to, to give a couple tools as to how we might Im, improve the, uh, our own execution of, of the logic. So that moves us into a Q&A period. Hopefully you're, that have, if you have any questions, you've posted them so that Sam can and read them. Great, thanks David. Can you hear me okay? I can. I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as a reminder to everyone, you can submit those questions that you have for David through uh, your chat interface there. So one question for you, can you talk through an example of when you have brought data into the conversation um, and how you did that? Sure. Um, 
my background obviously being an engineer, I, I, I love data and I love bringing data into the conversation. Um, one of the things that, that I added at the last second into the, uh, the appendix in here, I'll, I'll go to it now, is, um, is a pretty easy way to think about different ways of creating a presentation using either what we talked about, the inductive reasoning method or the deductive reasoning method. And it's actually a good way also to, to remember, you know, what's the difference between inductive and deductive re, uh, reasoning. But when you think about it, if you've got evidence or some kind of data um, that you have, you can go through it in an induct, inductive way where you can say, we know this and this is fact. And so my point about that fact is this. We also have some more evidence. So I'm, I'm traveling down the, the, the left-hand side here. So we have some more evidence or some more data or some more facts that we learned at another point in our, in our um, juncture. And this is what it is. And here's the point that I want to make about that evidence. And then you proceed with doing it the same. Then at the conclusion, you can sum up all the points that have been made. So you, you, you talk about, you know, point one right here, point two, point three. And then you're, you're going to conclude with what, what is your big point. And so my big point is that we should not increase our advertising budget by 5%, as we, but we should increase it by 7 right, or something like that. The other way to do it is, is in this deductive way. And so you would start at the top with, I think we need to you know, increase our advertising budget by 7%, not, not 5%, and then sum all the reasons why you believe that to be true. And then you would go into, and I'll prove to why I think that those are all the points. And that's so you'd bring in point A and, and bring up the evidence that proves point A, then maybe point B and bring up the evidence that proves point B. Um, so one of them, you're leading the audience through the data and essentially you're inducing them to come to the same conclusion you have. Therefore, it's a good way of thinking about this inductive. You're, you're inducing this. Here, you're saying, here's my conclusion and I'll show you why we should all, uh, in all you know, have the same uh, we should deduce um, that as the right kind of answer. So this is a pretty easy way to, to look at if, you're, if you've got evidence and you're trying to support a point um, and, and you want to be more revealing and surprise the conclusion at the end, this is a really good way of doing it. And this is, this is oftentimes done in kind of a salesy way versus the, you know, getting people to agree with your big point and then, make sure that they all know that that conclusion is sound, right? And that make, that gets everyone comfortable with it. So those are two pretty basic ways of, of going through presenting data and, and having it align with a conclusion, either, either the big point or the conclusion at the end or the, or the one that you made at the beginning. Two, two pretty good techniques. Great, thank you. Um, and do you another question that's that's come in? Um, where where do you see in in your area of work? Where do you see this coming up the most? Um, having the need for these kind of conversations. Um, so part of that probably comes from um, my history a little bit, but I see this, and I would break it up back into the what we I didn't really dive deep into it, but the four P's of marketing. And, and, you know, I think that one of the areas that is most contentious in, in business is the product P. They're huge decisions, oftentimes very big um, investments are required. And quite frankly, some people in the company, you know, the products can become um, their pet and, or, you know, pet projects, a certain product, or they get so invested in it. So it's really easy for the product decision uh, in the four P's to become something that is not really well, um, well founded, well established, well logic out. Um, people may fall in love with the product before the customer does. And so I think that that's one of the areas that, that maybe I personally have seen, uh, seen it most. Um, you can think of another area where, where people may support or not support some decisions around, um, the, the pricing. 
um, you know, and, and we need to use some good evidence about, you know, what is the market uh, for a product and, and what do we have um, to evidence that might say, you know, what the, the market can sustain a 15% price increase for this, you know, new generation of product. And so I've seen um, both on the side of totally overpricing, um, where there really wasn't much evidence in, in the area of, yes, the, the market is willing to pay that, or total underpricing where um, it was uh, there was no evidence, no data brought to the the uh, the case where you know what the market actually will value it more highly, and so where a lot of money was left on the table. I think you could also um, take a look at it in the other two P's about you know the promotion. Obviously, we we did talk here, and we kind of use this advertising example. But you know, how should we promote? What kind of sales should we use? Um, our, you know, is one of the areas that, that the whole world has gone through in the last two decades has been, you know, new media. And and you know, I, I, quite frankly, when I was getting my MBA in the in the late '90s, you know, we thought new media was going to change once. Well, I think new media has changed about five times since then. Um, and you know, Twitter wasn't even something that we knew about. Um, so so I think constantly. There's platforms for uh, promotion, platforms for advertising, platforms for, for getting customer engagement and, and uh, gauging uh, customer satisfaction. And so I think there's certainly areas in there where, you know, is the data really being gathered? Um, are people's arguments sound as to um, why we're, you know, why we're, you know, doing, you know, this type of advertising or attending that kind of, of, of trade show? And then, of course, on on the fourth one, um, I would say is is you know the the place decision. Um, certainly, you know, new era, new digital era. Um, for some for some audiences, it's become should we should we sell online? Should we disintermediate our dealers? Um, and so there have been a lot of arguments about. Uh, sticking with traditional distribution models or going to new distribu distribution models. And so there can be a lot of, 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 you know, poor thinking that goes into those kinds of decisions and making sure that, that the logic is sound, the data supports it, and, and that we're, we're doing things in a, in a reasonable, thorough, thought-through way is something uh, um, most valuable there. So I can see that this applies in, in all cases. My own history, my own background, I've got a lot more on the product side. And so I saw it there all the time, you know, arguing for a product or arguing for a change in a product. Um, so that's that would be my uh, my big one for, for a watch out would be on the product side. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and someone ha had shared that um, also on the marketing campaign side um, for the reason that people fall in fall in love with because they are the sponsors, you know, they're falling in love with that marketing campaign. Have you seen that as well and having to bring these kind of conversations into marketing yeah, exactly. campaigns? Yes, yes, exactly. I think there's the, um, you know, I've, I've had to argue um, with with people who loved an ad campaign mostly because they, they, well, it was either their idea and they thought it was cute, but no one else thought it was cute. <laughs> or because they they really liked the the sponsor that they chose for it. Um, you know, three decades ago, it was, um, I can't even remember the name of the actor, but he did he did something at the company I worked at in Denver, um, and he was the he was he was a comedic actor, um, and and the people in the advertising group and and maybe the upper management because he did more of a corporate message type thing um upper management there probably chose him and, and thought okay um leslie something i can't remember his last last name but he was in those you know naked gun series and stuff like that and and it, it was hard to watch him as a corporate spokesperson so somewhere along the line someone knew him they thought they liked him you know they thought they were getting a big shot and and there wasn't a lot of good support as to okay this is this was a good idea, but of course, due to politics, it, it went through anyway. But I can see how there's a lot of, you know, early on people do fall in love with a certain campaign and 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 an allure to to something that just because it connects with them, 
and this campaign connects with them, they don't test whether the campaign connects with everyone. Sure. Sure. Um, another question. So go, to go back to the inductive and deductive strategies that you were sharing, I know we talked about it from the, the data standpoint, but do you have some examples of types of scenarios when an inductive or deductive strategy may be more effective? Um, that's a good question. So I would, I would actually say that some of it may be um, your personality and the personality of your audience in some cases. So if we, if we, so if I went back to what you can usually see is, well, let me, I'm actually thinking through this as, as I go. So when it comes to a pure presentation, it's a little bit of, do I want that hook at the end and keep people suspenseful? And I get that, okay, this is my conclusion. So if I, if it's, if it, if you want to hold it as a mystery and that if you're making a choice between, you know, decision A or decision B, and people kind of know that's what your choice is, but you want to hold some suspense till the end, that might be a good way is to use that inductive reasoning because you have to get people to continue to buy in. And, and it's always good to have people's heads shaking up and down, yes, 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 and then when you make your recommendation, they just kind of, inertia kind of carries them into, yes, I agree with you. Um, I think going back to the actual um, um, logic of, of the, not just the presentation part, but maybe the whole um, how do you use the the tools of, of reasoning. I'll go back to this slide and and you and you you think about it and it's a little bit of of where am I starting? If I'm starting with a lot of data, so so I'm I'm starting with with already having data, which is up here, then I'm probably going to want to go through how do I make some uh, fact out of that and then make a decision. And, and support either a, a new theory or a new paradigm or a new decision if I have a lot of data. So, so I may have a whole bunch of, of marketing data about some old campaigns and some new things that we've been tracking. So now I wanna go find out whether we should branch off into a new product line and I can ask those questions. But if it's a, uh, if, if, the, if the theory has come to it and it's a, um, should we ask this question, right? Should we go into, um, a new marketplace? Should we launch a new product in Europe? And then then you start here and you say, well, we don't have any data about Europe, so therefore you're starting from the bottom and you need to start using some deductive reasoning, whereas you got to go out and you got to make some predictions, like what is the data we need to gather? So what what do we what do we predict the, the possible factors might be for launching this new product in Europe? And then, then you have to go out and you have to do the deductive reasoning and you're actually gathering the, the data. Now, if your own experiments were an inductive type or deductive type, that doesn't necessarily mean that when you're making your recommendation, your presentation, that it needs to be follow the same kind of format. You, you could do a whole lot of, of uh, starting using the inductive process to come to your conclusion and then present it to an audience in a deductive way. Hopefully wow, that that's makes really sense. Yeah, that's great information. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so we I, we have one more question for you. So all of this has been really, really fruitful information. Um, if there's one thing that you would advise that we all take back into our work to consider moving forward as we're having these conversations, what would, what would that one thing that we change be? Um, I think it's be a skeptic. Um, and and so the root the root thing about being a skeptic is is always be opening open to questions right so so be a marketing skeptic um, and that really leads you to being to forcing yourself to think about marketing as a science um, don't just accept the things that we've always been doing don't just accept the media that we've always used um, so I think that would be the one thing is to is to always once you start becoming skeptical and then you you either need to support your skepticism or you need to um, deflate your skepticism will force you into asking questions, force you into looking for evidence. And so I think that's a, a really key thing. Um, and I think that comes from that um, message that I have about, hey, you need to remember that marketing is a science. You know, marketing isn't just um, just an art and a black art, you know, maybe it was at one time back in the 40s and 50s. And if you've ever seen, you know, Mad Men, um, um, Tom Draper, I think that's his first name, Tom Draper, 
right? Um, he 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 makes it out as if it, you know, he makes all this stuff in, in, up in his head, and he's successful, you know, um, Madison Avenue uh, marketing guru. But uh, but the marketing as a science has really come a long way, and so being a skeptic starts you down the right road of, of making sure that that we're applying the the scientific um, parts of, of marketing uh, in, in the right way. There's certainly a lot of art to, to the final execution, but I think the, uh, the foundation and, and a lot of the work that we do in the four P's of marketing and the decision making uh, really is, um, you know, at least as much science as it is art. Uh, that's really that's really good insight. Thank you. So we'll all leave here today agreeing that we will be more skeptical <laughs> and ask more questions. Um, <laughs> I like that's it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, don't don't believe know. the alternative facts, as I think. Yeah. I guess that's the bottom, bottom line message. Don't believe alternative facts. Make sure the facts are facts. <laughs> Stick with the facts. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Great. Well, you know, thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And and David, again, thank you so much for all of this great information for us to take into our work. Um, as a quick reminder to everyone to view upcoming webinars and to request previous recordings, please do visit our website at www.colorado.edu forward slash alumni forward slash webinars and have a great rest of your day and go Buffs. <laughs>